Welcome to the award-winning Superhuman Academy podcast, where we interview extraordinary people to give you the skills and strategies to overcome the impossible. And now, here's your host, Jonathan Levy. This episode is sponsored by Comrade Socks. For years, I've known about the health benefits of wearing compression socks, especially when I travel or have to sit for extended periods of time. You know, things like reduced risk of blood clots, improved athletic performance, reduced soreness and swelling, and much, much more. The problem? Most compression socks are hideous, expensive, and uncomfortable. That's why I replaced mine with Comrade Socks. Comrade Socks are engineered for all-day comfort and support, plus they come in neat colors and patterns that you'll actually be proud to wear. To get your very own pair of Comrade Socks and get 20% off your first order, visit ComradeSocks.com superhuman or use discount code superhuman at checkout. That's C-O-M-R-A-D-S-O-C-K-S dot com slash superhuman. Greetings, super friends, and welcome, welcome to a super fascinating episode of the Superhuman Academy podcast. You guys, this week, we are joined by Todd Herman, and I have to say, this is one of the best episodes I remember recording in a very long time. Todd is a performance coach and mental game strategist for ambitious entrepreneurs, athletes, and leaders who want to achieve wildly outrageous goals. He's helped clients reach Olympic podiums, build multi-million dollar companies, establish brands that have become internationally known. But he is best, best known not for his sport training and coaching, but for his best-selling book, The Alter Ego Effect, The Power of Secret Identities to Transform Your Life. He is based in New York City and lives with his wife and three young children, and he's currently the world's worst ukulele player. His words, not mine. This episode was incredible, uh, mind-blowing, insane. I actually am in the middle of a 24-hour fast, about to break the fast, and I would not take back one minute of this podcast episode. In it, we talk about a fascinating concept that you can use to get yourself at higher performance levels, and it's the alter ego effect. We talk about Todd's intense story of getting to where he is, the trauma and abuse that got him there. He shares very, very openly and explains how he went from A to B in a linear fashion. Really fascinating episode, as I've said. So without any further ado, please meet my new super friend, Todd Herman. Mr. Todd Herman, how are you, my friend? Jonathan, I am doing super fantastic today. Thank you for asking. Yeah, pleasure. It's such a coincidence that just today a friend tagged you in a post involving another friend. And I was like, wait a minute, I'm interviewing Todd Herman today. He was like, cool, (laughs) say hi. So you have a hi from uh, Maurice and from Zvi Band, which is exciting. Oh, Maurice, he's a good dude. Yeah. Yeah. Um, That's the uh, the great benefit of the world that we live in today is it becomes easier and easier to see how all the networks cross over each other. So Exactly. So for those who haven't had the chance to cyber stalk you through uh, various mutual friends, tell me a bit about your superhuman origin story, what you do, how you do, and how you started doing it. Sure. Um, Lots of loaded questions in there. Um, this is us trying to connect the dots, um, going backwards here, but, uh, you know, origin grew up on a big farm and ranch in Western Canada. Um, you know, come from a a long line of uh, farmers and ranchers and, uh, you know, great thing about that world was it, uh, it taught me that you can survive in a world that you're not custom built for. So I'm a massive extrovert and growing up on a 10,000 plus acre farm and ranch, um, you know, my best friends, I didn't want them to be cows or horses. Uh, I wanted to be right. around human beings. So I established at a very young age that I heard about this place, New York City. We really didn't have any television, um, you know, that we watched growing up, and like at a young age at least. And I remember exactly where I was on our farm when I was out for a walk on our horse Cracker Jack. That I was like, I'm going to live in that place, New York City, someday, which is where I'm at. Have been here for 13 years. Um, but uh, my origin growing up in that farm, I ended up getting into athletics at a young age, became a really good, uh, pretty good athlete, got some football scholarships, and I was also a nationally ranked badminton player as well. And that always makes as sense in people's does. heads. Yeah. yeah, yeah, badminton totally. and football typically go together. 
So uh, sports has been a huge part of my life. And then when I got done playing football, um, I started coaching football because I wanted to stay involved and uh, ended up working with kids r- way more on the kind of mental game. Just gave them my strategies because I'm not a physically gifted human being. I'm not six foot four and 240 pounds or something like that. And um, but my real strength was that I was uh, maybe a feisty little bugger. And uh, as my older brother, Ryan, would say, um, he's persistent because you just can't get rid of him like a gnat. So uh, but that, you know, that came kind of innately, I thought, to me. But really, when I unpacked it, it was because I was diving into mental game stuff at a very, very young age. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, and, you know, to be kind of open with people, it was out of massive necessity. Uh, when I was 12, 12 years old, I was unfortunately involved in a, uh, I was at a church camp and, uh, two men over the course of a couple of days, um, sexually assaulted me. And it was a pretty brutal experience. Just them, uh, you know, out of the things that they said, obviously the things that they did to me. And, you know, that was not a part of my normal world at all. I wasn't around that. I was around amazing people all the time. And, uh, so I ended up spiraling into a lot of depression and, you know, at the, when I was 12 years old, uh, attempted suicide as soon as I got back from that experience, tried to drown myself in our family pool. And, um, but you know, there's that human condition that doesn't want us to quit or give up, or there's still something else that's left inside, but I still battled with suicide at a young age into my twenties. But, um, I wanted to kind of make sense of all this stuff that was happening in my head. And I would dive into as many books as I could possibly get around just mastering that emotional side of myself and, and the kind of the gift that it gave me was it really gave me a, um, uh, the process for actually how you find the zone state or the flow state that everyone Mm -hmm. else is trying to seek. And I could consistently find it every single game I played. And so it wasn't, you know, some magical ethereal thing that everyone, and actually I work, cause I work with so many pro athletes or Olympic athletes, even that world, they think it's, it's such a, a foreign thing that sometimes you get lucky with it. And I'm like, no, 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 no. We create our own luck with this. Like there is a wow. systematic process that we use biologically, physiologically that helps us to create the likelihood of that thing happening. And then when you kind of, when you keep, when you keep on running that path or, or, or grooving that, um, those neural connections in your own mind, now you create certainty in the mind. And mm-hmm. when you create certainty in an individual, all bets are off because now it's genetic. It's in, inside your DNA code. So when I compete, when I write, when I do what I do, I can very, very quickly find that flow state where there's no judgment, no anxiety, no any worry or doubt about whether or not you think you can or cannot do it. And when you find that amazing place where all of your creative capacity comes out of you, there's no telling what you th- what you can and cannot do in that moment, wow. and you find these kind of gifted, uh, you know, experiences of performance. So, wow. um, anyways, kind of long story that. short, that's my that's my kind of origin story. No, that's fantastic. You know, and, 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 and and then I got into like the work that I do because, and especially focusing so much on that inner game with athletes, and then growing into working with corporations and le- leaders all around the world, billionaires, royal families, and stuff like that is um, my the other great gift that that experience gave me at a young age was I've got an extraordinary level of compassion for the experiences that other human beings go through. Yeah. And um, I don't treat people like they're a nail and I've got a hammer with only one tool because I used many things to help me, you know, achieve things or cope with things. And so I've got this, you know, really big toolkit of things that I can help people with, um, which, you know, and I love doing it. So, wow. Wow. Well, first off, thank you for sharing authentically and openly. I I know how much good comes of that because I have a similar story with, uh, albeit not as much of a trauma, but also a past of near suicide. And, Mm -hmm. um, and I think there's so much value there. I want to ask you to, to, well, here, let's jump onto this. Can I just jump onto that for a second? Please. So like, so, um, you know, for, for you, how long did you keep that kind of private from other people as well? Because, you know, if there's, if there's one thing that you learn when you work with people, cause I'm a, I'm a practitioner. I work with people like one-on-one, you know, now I've got like large training, you know, stuff and just like you do. And, um, you know, I've been able to impact, uh, a, a, a lot of people in, in a leveraged way, but my still, my first love is working with people face to face, toes to toes. And, and I know that shame and guilt drive a lot of people's behavior. So how oh, long yeah. did you kind of keep that private because you didn't want people to judge you or think that you were, you know, whatever over a decade. Yeah. Over a decade. And it, it wasn't until the point where I made the connection that it was the source of my strength mm. that it finally became okay to share. And by the way, I will say it took 
people like yourself, people in positions of influence, people yeah. that are role models, t- taking the step first and going, hey, I suffered through this. For me to go, oh, okay, I'm not going to lose everything if I'm vulnerable. No, yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's 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 huge. There's this. It's one of my favorite things, maybe about the kind of world that we live in today, is that uh, there is a, a lot more vulnerability. It took me, and now it took me an extraordinary amount of time because I've only shared this stuff recently in the last couple of years. Um, it was always my kind of you know skeleton in the closet that I, you know, only I knew. No one, I never told anybody for the longest time. Wow. And you know, some of this is because I'm still torment isn't the word. Uh, but I still, because that experience unfortunately was videotaped and, um, and that, and, and that videotape is a popular videotape inside of the pedophile community in the, in the interwebs. And I still have people, you know, sometimes it's, it's, it's definitely monthly. It happens at least monthly where people will send me a a gif of that experience when I was 12 or, and try to extort money from me or, or many other things. Um, I've had, I've had people try to, um, uh, you know, duplicate my identity. They've, they've, because of the, all the different breaches that happen across the internet on these different platforms, sometimes they are, they're able to like go in and guess passwords and they go in and they, they, they will have, this is actually a recent experience where they've gone in and they've, um, set up a, a pass, a password question where it's, um, you know, they'll ask uh, that I would have to then answer the next time I go in, which is a, what's your favorite church camp you went to when you were 12. Um, wow. and so, yeah, so, I mean, uh, I could I could deal with it as like it's it's sort of a weekly or monthly torment, but you know it's that uh, come and get me kind of thing. You know That's you can't. Wild. Yeah. So I can't imagine the human being who does something like that. But, oh, there's a there's a lot of ne'er do wells that are out there. Some just evil people. So, um, wow. but. That doesn't color my view of like what the world is, is I think, and, and that's my challenge. I think with social media that people have right now, and this, and and I'm only talking about bringing this up because you know so much of our experience and what we create in the world is very much a mental and inner game thing, and that's where yes. I've lived for such a long time. And and I'm not saying that because I'm a practitioner of it. It's just the, it's just the true reality of things. We create we as human beings create meaning from stuff. And, and I think that the one thing that people could walk away from if they're bombarded with all these messages from social media or the media itself is that we live in a pretty crappy place. And, and you know, the data just doesn't support that at all. We live in probably, it's the greatest time to ever be alive. Think about this, billionaires 120 years ago lived worse than some of the poorest people in the Western societies do right now. Like television, you know, running water daily, you know, electricity, you know, all these different pastimes that you can explore, you know, groups that you can find and tribes that you can find so much easier. And, and we forget that. And, and so I like to, what I like to do is like sort of hold up the mirror and create paradigm shifts. People say, Hey, like, you know, you know, there's many, many things that we can be grateful for. And, uh, yeah. Yeah. So anyway, Super important. I want to, for you. <laughs> I want to get so much into this, this mental game thing, because it's something I want to improve in my own life. I first want to ask bridge the gap for me. Your, your 12 yeah. year old just suffered this trauma. Now you're working with some of the top performers in the world. My background is learning. I want to know yeah. how you learned all this incredible, valuable information. What was that process like? Yeah. So, um, it was, Probably different than a lot of people think. Um, I am not a consumer of other people's information and books. Uh, and I was fortunate. I'm a very big believer in apprenticeship and um, stewardship, like tucking yourself underneath the wing of someone who's the best. And I had uh, my dad, when I was leaving the, the farm, they knew that I wasn't coming back, that I was, uh, you know, I had my ambitions set elsewhere kind of thing than, you know, taking over the farm and everything. But, uh, and I told her brothers that we're going to be doing it anyway, but he had said to me, he's like, listen, you know, you're going to go off your and, and do something very different than how you grew up. But here's our advice. It's whoever go out and find whoever's the best it is at what you want to go and do and, right. and tuck yourself under their wing. And it was great because my dad in our area and even in the province itself is known for being the one, of the best farmers and ranchers that there is. And it sounds maybe crazy as like a, to other people who don't know that world, but there is so much nuance to being a phenomenal steward of land. And my right. dad was that way. And many people came to him for mentorship. And so I did that and I uh, was fortunate. I kind of, I've met Jim Rohn at a very early age. Um, and Jim helped me on the kind of speaking side of things. But my, my main and most important mentor was Harvey Dorfman, 
who is the giant of the mental game industry. He wrote mm-hmm. the book Coaching the Mental Game. He was huge in baseball. He was known as the Yoda of baseball. And uh, when I started getting into this mental game stuff, uh, I did. I did some research. I was doing lots of research on the psychology of like why things work the way that they do, and you know how can I help people, you know, manage their anxiety and their stress better. How can I help people? F- develop their focus and con- focus and concentration skills. And what I kept on finding in some of the books that I was reading was a lot of ethereal ideas, like, like platitudes, like just do it. Wonderful idea. Thank you very much for that. And it's true. Yes, you need to just do it. But then what happens when people are at the precipice and they can't find themselves, the, in, they right. can't find the strength inside to do it, to, to make the leap or whatever the case is. And, and the reality is there's just a lot of nuance that's there. So I reached out to Harvey Dorfman cold because his book, Coaching the Mental Game, was the only one that sort of made sense. He was like very pragmatic. He had practical advice for people. He was very much in your face, which meshed well with probably my personality type in some ways. Mm -hmm. And I reached out to him cold and I asked if I could come down to uh, North Carolina where he lived at the time and spend some time with him. Just my offer was, I'm sure you've got more books than you. Can I come down and be an administrative assistant? Can I like clean up your office for you, organize stuff for you, so you know, valuable. take, take care of just anything that's just a, 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 a needle in your ass kind of thing. That's just annoying. And, um, you know, I eventually got him on the, on a phone, on a phone call and he's like, you don't want to live with me, kid, do you? And I was like, no, 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 no. I've got an aunt and uncle who live in the area. I can stay with them. They live just down the road from you kind of thing, or they live close to you. And so after some more back and forth, he's like, all right, come on down. And it was January. And that was right before the baseball season was going to be starting a month and a half later. And I spent 33 days with Harvey. And, um, over the course of those 33 days, I saw him work with the greatest baseball players at the time coming in and making their annual pilgrimage to spend some time with Harvey. And I got, I got to sit in on those sessions and I got to really see how the best in the industry, Harvey worked with the most elite and some of them go down as the greatest baseball players of all time. Andy Pettit, Roger Clemens, um, Craig Biggio, and and people like that. And he, uh, I just got to see what they were actually struggling with, which was not going to be found in a book somewhere. Hmm. And it was like, um, uh, it was very different than what I thought. Now, what the elite struggles with, and what the 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 um, the average middle of the pro level is, are, are actually very different as well. And um, and so, yeah, that's how I learned. I, I really believe in learning way more by getting on the field of play, getting yeah. punched in the teeth, you know, getting your nails dirty, you know, uh, getting scuffs and bruises. Mm-hmm. And so that ability is what has given me, I know, the great strength I have over other people who might do what I do because a lot of them is based on kind of intellectual thought and not on the field of play stuff. Like what, as yeah. ac- what, are, what are these people actually thinking? Not what the researcher thinks they're thinking, but – what are they wow. actually doing? And so the only way you can get that nuance of how super learners or super humans or, you know, super performers, whatever the case is, true, what, what is by working with them one-on-one. You've got to have practitionership. There has to be a face-to-face, toes-to-toes, nose-to-nose experience that you've got. And you have to have skin in the game because think about it. People are paying me to get a result, which is to Really, we're, we're mastering mental game, inner game stuff so that they can perform better, so that they have a higher batting average or they've you know, got more wins on the USTA, the tennis, uh, the tennis circuit or whatever the case is. And um, when, I, when I give them a strategy and it doesn't work and then the next week's strategy doesn't work and the next week's strategy doesn't work, you know, they're not going to be clients for very long. Whereas inside of groups, people can hide in there. Ideas get to hide in there because groupthink happens. Right. Someone goes, if, you know, if they want to be buddies with, um, uh, with Jonathan, they're like, yeah, yeah, that worked for me. It was awesome. And, and then someone Mm -hmm. goes, and then, and then what happens is you get this domino effect and someone goes, oh shit, I didn't do it, but I don't want to be left out of the tribe. So yeah, yeah, I did it too. It was, it was a great idea. And, and you see that happen. I see it just as someone who does this for such a long time, I see it happen at workshops and big stadiums where people are going for leadership events or whatever. And I just sit there and kind of chuckle because fundamentally I know that that's actually not what the elite human beings on the planet are actually doing in order to achieve success. Like so much of the stuff that's propagated just is not true. Wow. So what I'll give you an example. I'll give, I'll give you an example. with that. Okay. Um, uh, you just used the word earlier about authenticity. You're like, Hey, thank you so much for being authentic Mm -hmm. and sharing. You know, vulnerable is actually the word I, I prefer. Authenticity is just not something I'm going to ever pursue because, um, uh, not that, not that the word in and of itself is a bad thing, but it's the way that society has now co-opted that word. And now it's a, 
um, social virtue signal that people are yeah. putting out to other people. I'm just being authentic. And it's like, no, you're being an asshole. That's not authenticity. <laughs> That's you lacking the skills of understanding how to communicate something more effectively so that you don't have to piss off and alienate other people. Mm -hmm. So um, the authentics uh, or authentic self, another thing, okay? There, a, you can't put a human being underneath a microscope and see the self. There's no such thing as a self, okay? Right. We use these words and you're someone, I mean, you're gonna appreciate this stuff and, and you would have found this as well over your, um, your travels through the world of you know, leadership and personal development is that words can trap people. And we have many words that we use in our language that end up sort of trapping without people even realizing it, like the self or my identity. You know, A, there is no one you. Even you is an example. There's no one you. Like how you are right now, you know, if I was interviewing you, there's going to be a different you that shows up, right? But right now you're right. the curious, you're the, you know, you're the reporter, you're the journalist who's trying to unpack and get value for your, for your people. But so there's many selves that show up for Jonathan. So stop trying to describe yourself as this one thing. That's why the resume and the about me page on your website are the two hardest things you'll ever write in your life. Because right. you sit there and you go, I'm way more than that. Right. Yes, but in context to what you're applying for, what's the version of you that you want to be putting forward that makes sense to this employer? OK, mm -hmm. we don't need to be telling, you know, that you built a chicken coop when you were seven years old. Like, I don't know if that tells the best story for what's going to get you the job at the investment capital firm. I don't know if that's going to work unless right. by some miracle the, uh, the interviewer is also built a chicken coop. Um, and so, you know, authenticity. If you listen to anyone who's ever been successful, there is no interview I have ever seen, found, whatever, where someone said, yeah, the reason I'm so successful or, you know, I built up the career that I did is because I was really, really authentic. And I was, no, they don't. Because anyone who's trying to pursue tough stuff to break through comfort zones consistently is constantly reinventing themselves. Right. And so really it's that if there was something that's being authentic about you, it's that you have a willingness to jump into the brambles and the bushes and get yourself nicked up and scarred because you know on the other side of that is an extremely uh, more valuable version of yourself because you're tougher, you can withstand more, you can hold bigger weights on your shoulders, you can do bigger things, which now you can hold up bigger ideas to allow other people to join you in whatever your mission mm -hmm. is. Like that mm -hmm. stuff's so valuable. And so I just not gonna, I'm not gonna allow, you know, my community, my world to get caught in these traps that the rest of the world wants to set around screw it. I could care less if someone thinks I'm being authentic and, and I just don't care because right. I know I'm a good person. I'm kind, but I challenge people because that's my job. That's what I'm hired to do is to help you break through because if you knew how to do it, you wouldn't need me. But instead, I'm going to drag you by the throat up the mountain <laughs> to the top where you said you wanted to reach because the greatest enemy to achievement is always the self. It's always you. You will always get in your own way. It's not all this other bullshit circumstance that people want to lay out there because it's just not true. Right, right. Tell me about the alter ego effect. What is it? Because it, I do want to get deep into flow, which we started yeah. out talking about. But I, I first want the audience to understand the work you're most known for. Yeah. What, what's it all about? Sure. So, um, so what is the alter ego effect? Um, uh, well, it's, it shows that there's some sort of cause that happens, but, um, you know, the one thing that gets in many people's way when it comes to pursuing things, achieving things, getting themselves out there, allowing themselves to show up like they know that they can is, um, their, their ego will get in the way of that. You know, there's doubt, there's worry, there's judgment of what other people might think of them. Will I get kicked out of the tribe? That kind of anthropological, you know, narrative that's just built inside of the human condition of not, you know, because 4,000 years ago, if you were kicked out of your tribe, you were going to, you know, suffer probably right. death out on the plains by yourself kind of thing or in the mountains. So community is a big part of how we're built. And, um, and so the pursuit towards things that ego gets in the way and that concern of being found out or imposter syndrome. We've got many things that get in the way. And um, what I found about a few years into my career, once I started working with better and better quality athletes, higher level athletes, pros and Olympians, um, or even people who had a pro mindset, but that were in the amateur 
ranks, they would use words like, I've got this other persona that I step into when I go to the court or the field. You know, I have this other identity or I have this kind of, you know, um, alter. They wouldn't necessarily use the word alter ego, but that's they're all talking about the exact same character. thing. I have this character that I step mm-hmm. into exactly or use. And and for me, that's exactly what I used when I played football and when I played badminton. I didn't take Todd on the court. I had this other composite individual that would go out there, custom built to help me win out there. And so for me, it was in early on, it was like, oh, that's really cool. Like, I did the same thing. That's really interesting. And I would find out maybe a little bit more about theirs. Mm-hmm. But it never became like my a, a core part of my training principle. And then I had to I stopped myself and I was like, wait a second, Todd. Are you going to continue to possibly use the same training techniques that cause people to become good performers or are you going to like take a look at the people who are truly elite and what they're doing and bring that stuff down to the others to allow them to escalate up because sometimes that's what happens you've got pro individuals who are being taught stuff that the average people do and that just it decelerates their success so that's what I ended up doing. I ended up becoming known for building out alter egos and secret identities for pro athletes, Olympians, the world of sport, wow. carried that into the worlds of leadership, um, helping uh, leaders of businesses, um, you know, executives. Now it's gone into the hundreds of thousands of people where you've got moms, you've got dads who, who are now understanding this concept, which is that this is a natural part of the human condition. We naturally do this. I think a really big part of the work that we do is I don't try to invent stuff from scratch. I want to leverage already existing things that are switches going on inside of the human mind because you already know them. You already experience them. So every single person that's listening to this or watching this, you've used an alter ego. You did this when you were a kid. And this is important because from the age of one to seven years of age, neurologically, that's when, um, Human beings are caught in the theta brainwave state, which is the direct access to the creative imagination, okay? Mm -hmm. And so the theta brainwave state, that's where zone and flow, like if you see any four-year-old that's playing with a Tonka truck or a dollhouse or playing with a ball or something, they're just engaged in the activity. Mm -hmm. Like, I mean, I've got three little ones and they're all seven and under and, you know, we can get frustrated as parents because I'm like, you know, my oldest daughter, Molly, I'm like, Molly, calling her for dinner. Molly, I got to call her like nine times and we get frustrated. But really what's happening is they're just caught in like the state that we would love to be experiencing all the time. They're okay? super present, <laughs> super present. Now, the reason I say that is because now what are the things that they're doing when locked into this beautiful thing called the creative imagination, mm-hmm. which is truly our greatest superpower is our creative imagination, our ability to st- tell story and narrative in our own mind, our ability to um, you know, suspend the disbelief of what we think we can and cannot do and you know, wear some other idea in our own mind, um, to creatively problem solve things, to create a heaven from hell or a hell from heaven. So one of the core things that young children do is they pretend that they're their favorite superhero, their favorite character, Dora the Explorer or Wolverine or Black Panther or Wonder Woman, or it's their favorite athlete you know, when they're on their, in their front driveway um, you know, because it's that, well, I know I'm limited or I'm not as good as that person, but what if I was that person? So I'm going to play as Wayne Gretzky or Michael Jordan or Serena Williams or, you know, David Beckham or whoever it is, Lionel Messi, doesn't matter. And it's us wearing and separating maybe our limitations from what we're actually going to go and try and execute. So we do this stuff naturally as human beings. And then what happens after seven years of age, the frontal lobe starts to develop up here. We start to develop right. judgment and reasoning skills. We look at what other people are doing that are older than us. Oh, they look a little bit more serious or they don't play these games anymore. So I shouldn't do that. And we look at our child years as us being childish. No, that's so wrong. Uh, that's actually, there's so many lessons that are gifted with us that are there. So um, to carry this now forward, when I've helped build out alter egos for people, what it allows them to do is tap into the abilities and traits and qualities that they already have nested inside of themselves. And now they're using another mechanism to draw those qualities out. So it's not about being fake. It's not about being inauthentic like some people might think. No, because mm-hmm. you're not going out there. I'm not pretending to be a second rate Beyonce. I'm not pretending to be a second rate uh, Winston Churchill. I'm using that idea of what they represent in my mind 
to draw out the qualities that I want to show up on that particular field of play in the role that I'm bringing to it. So, you know, I wrote the book on it uh, and it's been really successful the last, you know, seven months it's been out and, you know, bringing it out to a wider audience of people to show them how to use it when you're a parent, how to use it for your kids, how to use it, you know, for that new role that you're taking on in uh, your, your office or your business, because you've got some limiting beliefs about what you think you can and can't do or what skills you do or don't have. All right. At this point, I want to pause and take a moment to thank our sponsor for Sigmatic, who is making it easy for everyday people to unlock the incredible health benefits of mushrooms. I originally learned about Four Sigmatic when I met their founder at a conference in 2015, and I have been pretty much obsessed with their products ever since. Personally, I use their reishi mushroom tea most nights for an all-natural sleep aid. I carry their chaga immunity blend anytime I travel, and I've also pretty much switched out my usual coffee or yerba mate for their unbelievably awesome mushroom coffee, either in ground or in instant form. Now, what I love about the mushroom coffee is that it combines chaga for immune support with lion's mane for intense focus. And because of that, I actually find it to be more effective than most nootropics or stimulants, including Ritalin, despite having only 40 milligrams of caffeine. It's honestly insane. If you haven't tried out their products, I strongly, strongly recommend you do so. And to encourage you to give them a try, we've actually teamed up with Four Sigmatic to bring you an incredible 15% discount. To take advantage of that, just visit foursigmatic.com slash superhuman today. All right, back to the show. Now, if I'm understanding this correctly, I can have multiple of these because as you're speaking, I'm actually really yep. seeing like I had a major pivot point in uh, in my own workouts when yep. I started taking on this different persona. People who know me know I'm actually not a competitive person. Uh, yeah, I really don't care if my competitors in business sell more than I do as long as I, you know, I'm happy with my results. But then yep. I step into a CrossFit gym. And suddenly I'm checking what everyone else is doing. I'm making sure that I'm lifting more weight and going faster. And it's helped yeah. me push myself to another limit. And I'm a total, my wife tells me, she's like, you're a totally different person in here. Uh, same is true when I coach. I don't do as much coaching as you do. But when yeah. I coach, I take on this much less difficult, much less demanding, much more empathetic persona. And I caught myself yeah. doing it last weekend in London when I met some clients. You know, I'm, I'm all ears and all heart. Yeah. And so, so how many do to, I get? <laughs> <laughs> well, you get as many as you need in order for you to excel in the areas that you want to excel in. And so mm -hmm. let me unpack that a little bit. So just like going back, this is why I was trying to preface everything with like the words we use end up trapping us. So there is no one you. You've right. got many roles that you play. So just like we've got many roles that we play in life, that also means that if you're in pursuit of being excellent in a few of these areas, then that might be, those might be great areas to be inspired to use an alter ego to draw the qualities out that you most want to represent. Like, you know, obviously from, you know, the interviews that I do or, you know, in this one here and the video, people are going to get that I'm probably a challenger personality type, right? right? Like when I'm working with people, I'm a challenger, but I mean, that's how I need to be built in order to do the work that I do with the, you know, you know, could be challenging personality types that I end up working with as well. Um, uh, because there's some pretty big egos that are out there and if they're going to come to work with me then I need to break that frame pretty quickly because I need to own the authority of that relationship in order to help shepherd them to because that's what a coach does He's, you've got to have the authority um, but it's not a taken authority it's an earned one um, and that's through getting people results so but when I go home so where my office is here in New York City I'm at the end of one of our one of the blocks here in West Chelsea and our apartment is at the top of the building just down the street here. I can see it. And when I go home, the last thing my kids want is a challenge or personality type to walk sure. through the door, right? They sure. want fun. They want playful. They want um, silly if necessary. And, and of course, there's going to be some challenging things that you do with your kids to, to, to level up their skills and, and get them mm -hmm. to see mm -hmm. what they're capable of. But I want to draw that, that fun, playful, and patient self out. Well, we all have these kind of ways that we describe ourselves. Like I typically wouldn't describe myself as a patient individual, but here's what I know after just working with thousands and thousands and thousands of people, that quality sits inside of me. Just like you, 
competitiveness, you say you're not competitive, but here's the thing. Competitiveness sits inside of everybody. It's just not, you just don't flex it as a muscle as often until you got into an environment because that's another thing. It's the environment that's actually also drawing that thing out of you because what is CrossFit? CrossFit has numbers. It's got leaderboards. It's got all, there's a whole, all these mechanisms that help to draw out competitiveness. And I mean, you, you know this because I know some of your stuff that you're going to talk about how one of the most overlooked parts of making change happen is your environment. Everyone looks at themselves like, what do we need to change about yourself? Whoa, 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 whoa. For one of the first places I start is how can we set up your environment right. so that it actually naturally draws the ambitions, the desires out of you or the skills that you need. Um, and so, you know, that, so that's an interesting thing. So patience lives inside of me. Playfulness sits inside of me. But all day long, maybe those things don't get flexed, you know, and, you know, it's, it's like anything. Whatever we use, um, we end up reinforcing for ourselves. Yeah. So when I get home, um, my inspiration for how I want to show up so that I can identify with a new idea of how I'm going to show up is Mr. Rogers. So Mr. Rogers, if you're not familiar because you're you know, outside of America maybe, is famous PBS broadcaster, had a children's show for, for decades and decades. There's an amazing documentary on him that you absolutely should watch called um, Won't You Won't Be My you Neighbor? Be my neighbor. Yeah. which is amazing. And what's crazy about that, uh, you're, people are going to see this now everywhere. This is what I love about this is I get pinged daily on Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn and everywhere else. The references to alter egos by other celebrities and professionals, executives, leaders, salespeople, um, CEOs, um, where they'll actually talk about this. But in that movie, like 25% of that movie is actually talking about Mr. Rogers' alter ego. Really? Yeah, 100%. And it's, and it's his hand puppet, the cat, his wife goes into this beautiful monologue about how, um, that hand puppet was the most true representation of Mr. Rogers because he could get the hand puppet or that cat to say the things that Mr. Rogers most wanted to say. He could be more vulnerable and say things that he was, you know, you know, I'm scared and you know, all this. And, um, and so that's the beautiful thing is, and even, and even Mr. Rogers, there's this great clip in the, in, the, in the show where he says, you know, it doesn't look very far, but the distance between here and here is, is not very far, but I can tell you it was very self-efficacious. So self-efficacy is that ability to, um, to really grow into th- that y- yourself, like really show up like you most want to. And I tell people the same thing. The difference between here and here or here and here isn't very far. But boy, does it ever make a big difference. You want to say I love you to someone, but you don't. You want to go and take the action and write the article today, but you don't. You want to do the post (sighs) about XYZ subject, but you don't. The distance between here and here, here and here doesn't look far. But man, these are massive chasms that people have to cross. And that's my job. I think that's my personal responsibility for the rest of my life is to build as many bridges to give people as many tools as possible so that more of this stuff comes out of here that they want to say that they want to do. Um, and the alter ego became my ultimate tool to help make that happen for people because of that self distancing that happens. And I talk about all the science inside the book of, of how to do it and how to use this. And wow, it's, it's been brilliant to see how many people finally see, more of themselves in the work that they do every single day because they're getting themselves out there. And again, whatever you need to do in order to make that happen, that's, that's personal to you. That's your own six inches between the years. And that's what I mean by only a practitioner could have understood that and found it. Yeah. Um, the Jordan Peterson, the, the psychologist, um, you know, who's preeminent nowadays, um, sent me a wonderful note just saying how, um, uh, he thinks that this book is uh, a foundational book that's going to last for generations and generations because you've given voice yes. to something that we've talked about for years and danced around, but you were able to find this thing. And that's a sign that a practitioner went and did the work to do it. So um, anyway, I, I love it in people's hands. Yeah. Yeah, it's incredible. I'm I'm like this close to uh, asking you if I can come be your administrative assistant and climb under <laughs> your wing because, wow, there's so much to unpack here. And I just, as you were speaking, popped open Goodreads and added your book, which is going to be my next read. Um, I, I'm dying to ask a question, which I'm sure you cover in the book, and it's yeah. mainly a curiosity thing. I want to know what it looks like in the room with your average athlete 
Like, what does it look like for you to actually build an alter ego? Are you actually telling them you're this and you feel this and you think this way? I'm just so curious what a coaching session with Todd Herman looks like. Yeah. So first it's, it's, I mean, think about communication in general, like just as a, you know, I've got a world that's built inside of my head and you have a world that's built inside of your head. And what most people get wrong in the worlds of like mentoring, consulting, advising, teaching, you know, leading other people is you, you're trying to like unpack this stuff and give it to someone else. No, 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 no. And especially in one-on-one environment, it's no, I want to deconstruct what your inner world looks like. And, yep. and then I can look at those puzzle pieces and go, okay, well, let's remove that block and let's yep. put in this one. But then it's also making sure that, because the only way that you can actually get to the point where you're in a room with me is you have to be 100% open and available to being coached, to being led, to being trained. Because if you're not, it's because the, the easiest um, analogy to use or quote to use is, you know, Bruce, Lee's, Bruce Lee has got some um, tremendous stuff that he said. Uh, you know, bring me, if you bring me a cup of water, you know, or a cup and that cup is filled with water, whatever I pour inside of it is, uh, one going to cause whatever's inside to overflow and B it's going to be, you know, mixing and mingling with what's in there. And so what I need you to do as someone who's willing to be coached is bring me the empty cup. Are you willing to suspend whatever you think, you know, and be truly willing to be coached. Um, and I can say this from personal experience. The reason I'm so you know, big on that idea is in the beginning years of my life uh, in the, when I, you know, after 18, I was an uncoachable person. I knew it all and I wouldn't <laughs> be coached. And it, and it's truly stunted, uh, my growth that way. And it wasn't until Harvey Dorfman really broke that on me. Um, when he hung up on me, he said, well, well, before he hung up, he said, you're not willing to be coached right now. So I'm not talking to you. And he just hung up. And I called him back. I'm like, what do you mean? I'm not willing to be coached. I'm, I'm on the freaking phone with you kind of thing. And, and he said, no, you've got your preconceived ideas and notions and you're not allowing someone who's been there, done that, skinned the knees and done all this work to truly impart some wisdom for you. So let me know when you want to come to me with an empty cup. And then, and then he's the one who really relayed the whole Bruce Lee quote to me. And then I got it. I was like, okay. And, and he's like, you, you, you're stunting your growth consistently, Todd. Like, this is just what you're doing. Um, and it's just a, it's a very poor, uh, you know, behavior set that you've got. So, and then, you know, so when I did that, boy, did things ever change. And it attracted in a ton of mentors all of a sudden in other areas yeah. of my life. Because now I was, I was truly willing and able. And just, you can pick up on it. I mean, I've had that experience where I've gotten off stage and people go, you know, hey, can I be your administrative assistant type of thing? And it was really just, you know, there was, there was something they were, they were trying to get to my Rolodex. They were trying to get to other things. They weren't mm. really passionate about learning and, um, being taught. So getting to your question about that then is first things I want to do is I want to understand how they currently see themselves. What are the blocks like? And, and I, and I walk through chapter three of the book, I give people the model for basically how you kind of unpack someone's identity or, you know, in the book, I call it the field to play model. But, you know, I'm unpacking things at a behavioral level, like what are the skills, what are the knowledge that you think you have or don't have? And, cool. and, then what, and then at the belief layer, what are the attitudes, the perceptions, the expectations and the beliefs that you have about yourself and the world around you? And then uh, core drivers, which is something that's very much missed in the work of making change happen, is sometimes the real hidden puppet strings that stop people from taking action is actually this core drivers layer where it's things like, um, core drivers are things that are bigger than you, that you're a part of your race, right. your religion, your, where you're from, your nation, mm -hmm. um, tribes that you're a part of, uh, of being a police officer, a military person, because you end up wearing the cloak of their behaviors and their narratives. So if there's a narrative that no one from my community has ever made it or everyone that's here right. is stuck and da da da, then, then you're going to act through that and you're not even going to realize that it's actually this boulder that's, you know, kind of holding you back. And so I just, I just unpack this stuff and then, um, and then from there, it's like, well, if you could show up, what's that ideal state that you want to show up as? Like, it's, or for the role that you've got or the position that you have or the player that you are and asked to play like, what, what 
what would allow you to be the most successful at that? What would you need to think right. about yourself, think about your skills, believe about yourself? What, are the, what What's the experience emotionally that you have when you're out there? And then the reason I'm asking all these questions is, is there anyone that you've come across in your life? Movies, television, books, you know, artists, musicians, people yeah. that you've already met, people that you're inspired by that already in your mind embodies that. Yep. And, and they go, yeah. Uh, or sometimes no, like you still got to unpack it a little bit more. And, uh, you know, in the book, I, I talk in chapter number one about Bo Jackson and Bo Jackson, you know, one of the greatest athletes to ever walk this planet. He's the only, uh, two sport, two sport athlete in America, major sport, uh, national football league. So football yep. and major league baseball to yep. be an all-star in two sports. That's an, ex that's exceptional, uh, skill. And, um, and Bo and I met at a, a conference in, in Georgia. I was in the green room waiting to go on stage and speak. This is a long time ago. And uh, Bo Jackson walks into the room and I'm like, Oh, that's Bo Jackson. I played him on yeah. Tech Mobile when I was a kid. He was on. He was he was the unbeatable running back on on this Nintendo game. Uh, he was actually the cheat code. You could hand it to him, and he would never be tackled. So, anyways, he walks up to me. He's like, "Hi," you know. He's, he's like, "Hi, I'm Bo Jackson." I said, "Hi, I'm." You know, we're the only ones in the room. He's like, and I'm like, "Hi, I'm Todd Herman. It's nice to meet you. You won me a lot of games on Tech Mobile when I was a kid." And he laughed and he said, uh, "You're not the first to say that." And uh, and so. He, he says, are you, are you speaking? And I said, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm going on next unless they just bump me for you. And he just laughed and said, like, oh, what are you going to be talking about? And I said, I'm going to talk to him about like, the mental game, but specifically I'm going to talk to him about using an alter ego as a way to activate um, the attributes and qualities that they've worked really hard at developing so that they truly flow out there and, and they you know create personal best for themselves. And he looked at me, kind of cocked his head to the side, and he said, Bo Jackson never played a down of football his entire life. And I said, interesting, tell me more. And he said, uh, well, growing up, people who knew me or know my story know that I was a, a pretty angry kid. I was a bit of a misfit and uh, got, into, got into some trouble. And while you'd think that maybe that anger would work well for you when you're playing football, because it's a pretty violent sport, uh, it made me you know, a little bit uncoachable. Um, I would take some bad penalties as a kid. And uh, it just wasn't really serving me. As, as, and I wasn't playing like, like I could because of those, because of those things. And he said, so one night I was watching this movie and this character came on the screen and he was like cold, calculating, methodical, unemotional. And I thought to myself, whoa, what if I took that out on the football field and played through that? And it was so Jason from Friday the it was Jason from Friday the 13th cold, calculating, methodical, unemotional. He just kept on coming at you. So people go, wait a second. An angry kid chose a serial killer from a horror movie. And I was like, yeah, it's, that's what it sounds like to you. But again, we all have our own personal experience in this world. Mm -hmm. And so, but in that moment, what he was grasping onto was the unemotional nature because on this other side, he took out this emotional kid. And on this side, he wanted to be unemotional. And that way, all of the skills that he already had could start flowing out of him. So he said, like Jason lived on the field. When I walked out on that field, as soon as my foot hit the field, boom, that's when Jason would come inside of me. And that's when he would take over. And I became nice. unemotional. And so my, he's like, I'm sure you're going to talk to the kids about goals. But he's like, my only mission out there was to destroy anything that got in my path. And with no emotion, that was the ending point. So just to unpack this for other people to see how they can maybe start playing with this without even you know going and getting the book, I still encourage you to get the book. But get the book. Um, <laughs> get the book. is is that so he had one thing that he was struggling with, and so I call that the enemy in the book. It's the, the enemy draws you into the ordinary world. It's just whether it's something that's internal to you or it's some concern that you have. But it's it. So for him, it was his emotional self overly emotional draw was drawing him away from this extraordinary world that he could show up as, but it was just, uh, it wasn't playing to his capability. So then what we discovered then was this unemotional, that was the really the superpower quality that he wanted to have out there. Now his alter ego embodies being unemotional. And he used Jason as the mechanism for him to anchor to, to hold on to that world of unemotionality. Okay. And which then allowed and created this space for his attributes that were already inside of him to come out. Wow. That's the, that's the real, that's one of the great powerful secrets here is, is that. And so if you're inspired by like one of my equestrian writers, uh, was with the Linda Carter version of wonder woman. 
So this is before the current Wonder Woman movie came out. Um, you know, she was struggling. She was acting a little bit uh, too nervous when she was on her horse. And you think about that world, equestrian. It's the only sport on the planet where you're sitting on top of this emotional conveyance tool. Horses, that's why they're used in therapy. You know, for people right. who've got Asperger's or people who are going through trauma and PTSD, they're, they're emotional. They're just these emotional beings that are phenomenal to be around. However, they also transmute when you're riding them, your emotional experience at the time, you know, right. football doesn't know it. People could, people don't know maybe when you're out there playing tennis, that there's this, you know, tornado of emotion going on inside of you. But if you're on a horse, people will know that because the horse will transmute that and they'll be jittery and all that. So that's not going to work well in the world of dressage, which is very intricate moves that you're doing where you're going and um, hitting patterns and spots inside of an arena. You need to be calm so your horse is calm so that you can hit these very intricate moves and intricate stops and, and, and that. And so for her, I said to her, I said, okay, well, is there anyone – we got to this point where I was like, is there anyone or anything that you think really embodies you know, what, how you want to show up? And she immediately went to – so hers was a little bit rare in some ways, but she – Wonder Woman. Because Wonder Woman always owns her space. She yeah. always stands her ground. No matter what, she always has the tool at the ready to help combat that. And so um, that was her alter ego. And then we, we, I talk about in the book the importance of going out and finding an artifact, a talisman, a tool that can help activate it. So for her, it was Wonder Woman's bracelet. So she went out and created a custom bracelet. And I said to her, make sure it has a loud clasp on it because – you know, just now this is getting into like the, the mental game side of things or the neuroscience of things, but sound is a phenomenal triggering device mm -hmm. to inspire emotion, activate emotions, whatever. And and so when that's when that snap claps together, that's when one room one takes over. It's not even just the act of putting it on, it's the clasp of it shutting. And wow. boom, that's that's when Lisa would step into Wonder Woman and 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 now this is the real trick, and I talk about this in the final step in the book of truly using this as a powerful mechanism to be the absolute best version of yourself you can possibly be, which is now you have got to commit to honoring that alter ego. You know, Don't you dishonor Wonder Woman by not activating those traits and qualities that she would come to that arena with by allowing Lisa's typical way of showing up to infect that experience. So I did that. So I talk about building mental movie theaters in your mind and I walk people through processes and how to do that. So when I was playing football and I used this, I went into my mental movie theater when I was sitting on the on the bench. I hadn't I just put on my shoulder pads and I would go into my mental movie theater, close my eyes, and I'd walk in the door and it was this uh, big room and there was two doors at the other end of the, the, the movie theater where I would do all my visualization stuff. And in through those doors became came my inspirations for my alter ego. One was Walter Payton, the Hall of Fame running back who played for the Chicago Bears, amazing, um, record holder, all that. And Ronnie Lott, who was a devastating uh, safety that played for the San Francisco 49ers. And then through the other door would walk five Native American warriors. So where I grew up in Western Canada, come from like uh, a really rich history of Native American history in that area. I've always been... Uh, I've always romanticized that world. I just loved it. I've been a, you know, I'm a very much a novice uh, um, researcher on it kind of thing. But those five uh, warriors would walk through led by Geronimo and they would come towards me and I had five trading cards sitting next to me on my bench. Okay. Three of them were Walter Payton, two were Ronnie Lott. And as they approached, Geronimo would be holding these five cards in his hand. And as they approached, he would reach out to hand them to me and Walter Payton would speak up and he'd say, uh, Todd, take these trading cards as a representation and an embodiment of all of us. And I'd reach out um, to grab them. And as I touched them with my, with my thumb and my index finger, Geronimo would tug back in that second. And that's when Walter, P Walter Payton would lean forward and he'd say, but don't you for one second dishonor our memory and the way that we would show up by not showing up like we would on that field of play. Wow. And that was me. Even now, like when I do it, I get, sh I get that, that, those shivers. And so then I would take them. Now I had them next to me and I'd put one of Walter Payton's in my helmet because I wanted to think like him out there. I took his other two and I put them in my thigh pads because I wanted to run like him. And then I had Ronnie Lotz and I'd shove them in my shoulder pads because I wanted to hit like him and be a devastating hitter like he was. Wow. And then when I put on the helmet, 
and I snapped it shut, that's when I would imagine those five Native American warriors and their spirit entering my heart area. And I, cause I wanted to bring that fierce, um, uh, focus that they had with me out there as well. So I didn't wow. go out there as Herman. That's what they, that's what everyone else saw. But inside my whole, my whole head is I had a tribe of seven that I was carrying with me out there wow. and I felt absolutely unstoppable. And so, you know, we all have tough stuff that we're trying to go, go through and we have people that we admire now build up that tribe around you that can be there to support you. We all understand that it's so important to have amazing relationships, amazing mentors, amazing coaches, amazing people just to be around, whether they're sons, daughters, brothers, sisters, moms, dads, friends, all that kind of stuff. We all know that to have to lead a rich life, you need that the, the value of that community helps you out so much. Doing things yeah. on your own is, is a very slow and stupid way to do things. However, and this goes back to the root of the alter ego, it was first coined in 44 BC by Cicero when he wrote it in a letter to a friend and he said, the alter ego is the other I or trusted friend. Now here is a man who is highly, is touted as being the greatest Roman statesman and philosopher of all time. So one of the greatest thinkers ever is talking about the value of an alter ego, mentioning it in a, a letter to a friend on how to lead a good life. And, um, and that's such a good idea to think about this through is, so we all know the value of having relationships around us to help us level up and, and lead a good life and help to catch us when we fall and stuff. But what about through the six inches of our ears where we live every single day? Having that tribe of people that you bring into your own mind where you master it, that you've got that trusted friend and ally that helps you to do the things that you most want to go and do and maybe help protect that sort of innocent self that gets worried about being vulnerable. And you yeah. know now the alter ego can take those slings and arrows for you because it wow. wasn't you that failed. It was – Jason that failed in that moment, or it was someone like whatever that inspiration was. So there's so wow. many kind of different wow, angles. Wow, wow. I'm going to stop you because there's so much goodness that I want to unpack a little bit of it. And, and there's a compliment at the end of this. What I love about your work is you are touching on so many different things that I've had to learn the hard way through life experience or through other teachers that I look up to. Eckhart Tolle, the yeah. idea of the pain body. If you carry around this self who identifies as a victim, you will be a victim. Yeah. Um, ego is the enemy. I mean, and really cool thing, what you built for yourself, this mental movie theater, that's a memory palace you built. Mm -hmm. And I've never even thought in eight years of teaching this stuff, I've never even thought of the fact that you could actually use a memory palace to get yourself into a mental state. Yeah. And that's the, that's the genius of, of the technique is I'm always discovering new ways to use it. So that's really cool. Um, we're coming up on time. So I want to ask yeah the memory expert in me can't forget you mentioned how you can always get into the flow state quickly is that yeah. is that predominantly alter ego or is there something else you're doing to get into that flow state so consistently so, yeah so the alter ego helps that because um what people have done maybe a poor job of maybe teaching other people about when it comes to the zone and flow state is the zone and flow state sits predominantly inside of that creative imagination world. Now, mm -hmm. creative imagination is sort of this maybe ethereal concept to other people as well, but um, when you unpack it from a brainwave perspective, now you're getting into the, um, the alpha and theta, right? Like I said, young children, one to seven, they're operating in theta consistently. Right. So they're, they're, they're playing and operating in zone and flow all of the time. So, and when you're taking a look at them, there is no expectation with their play. They're just playing. They're caught in the experience of it. And then when you look at them physiologically, what are they doing? They're very relaxed. When you also look at them, um, uh, one, of the, uh, one of the enemies for allowing zone and flow to happen or one of the kind of um, obstacles is having a very tight jaw area. When really? you start to – yeah, when you start to – because there's so many bundles of nerves that are connected in here that go into the brain. And that's why if you're clenching your teeth or if you've got TMJ like I do, which is someone who grinds their teeth in the night – it's actually more predominant inside in, in females than males. But if you've ever been in a car accident um, and you've had whiplash, what happens is this jaw area gets stretched. And it, you know, if you don't rehab it properly, um, you will end up grinding your teeth, which is what happened to me. So if you have a lot of tension in your jaw area, it's, it's just next to impossible for you to ever be able to find that flow state. So you want to have a relaxed jaw. So that's almost ingredient number one that we look for because that's something that you wow. feel like you can control, right? Like It's a powerful tip. Like just – just, and I'm mean, opening my mouth on the, on the thing, but like just relaxing that. So when you take a look at Michael Jordan, uh, Michael Jordan heard about this, like kind of my process for this through, you know, other people. And for him, he was like, it explained why 
I naturally moved towards sticking out my tongue when I played football, basketball, because it forced right. a relaxed jaw. And if you look at right. a lot of his basketball when he played, he was playing with his tongue out, right? So that forces, so that right there as a, as a physiological device helps relax it. Fascinating. Um, the other side of it is like understanding it from an ob, uh, understanding this from like a mindset perspective is if you know that the zone and flow state just exists inside of you already. This is one of the key things that if anyone here is someone who works with other people, don't ever approach someone as if they need to be fixed. Don't approach them and use language that would make it seem as though people need to go and find something or discover something outside of themselves. Yes. Because in the work that and how I treat other people is you've got everything that you need all the capabilities are already there they're buried under stuff whether it's that. perceptions paradigms you know um just uh lack of knowledge and understanding about things but no the genius is already there and i say that because when you understand that the zone and flow state is this you know little thing that's just waiting for you to just like trigger it to help come alive it's already there it's just waiting for you to unlock the cell to allow it to get out there I love that. now it's and again, some of these words I'm using, we use in the world of peak performance, allowing, trusting, right? Those are big things to, to do. Like when you find a human being who is 100% comfortable with themselves and they trust their scale, skills, trust their abilities, trust their preparation, trust their practice plan, trust their routines. Now all of a sudden it all comes to this point where they're pointing their skills, their skis down a ski hill that looks like the face of a cliff with ice and snow on it. And they're at the Olympic Games with their flag waving behind them. And now they need to race down it and execute the tight turns in order to um, achieve a personal best, which may or may not get them onto a podium. Mm -hmm. If I don't have that athlete 100% prepared to trust themselves in the moment, that everything that we've done to prepare you for that moment is right, it's good, it's yeah. meant to be in that moment, then – there's seeds of doubt that creep in. And now you're not operating 100%, you're operating at 96%. And that little 4% is the thing that separates the people who achieve personal bests and the people who have a run that was average or below average, or they catch a, uh, an edge and they end up into the you know orange screen on the left-hand or right-hand side of the ski hill. So allowing these things, understanding that all this stuff sits inside of you already, it's not out there, you're not something who needs to go learn it, you already understand the alter ego, you've played with this as a kid, when you, and now it's just you know being a little bit more playful with yourself now and allowing yourself to, to embrace it. Incredible. Todd, I, uh, I was so enthralled by everything you have to say, I didn't get a chance to ask you a single one of my, my questions <laughs> I always like to ask, which is fine. I accept that. Sorry, um, I didn't shut up, but I no, I, no, I, like, I, I want to come I, in and try to give as much value as I can. I would have stopped you if if you weren't delivering value bomb after value bomb. Uh, where can people pick up a copy of the book and uh, and learn more about you? Get in touch with you. Sure. Uh, so basically, any bookstore that's out there, it's um, in all the bookstores. It's in the airport bookstores. It's in um, online. You know, at all the all the big retailers, we've got. Uh, I think we've signed the deal for like. Uh, you know, eight or nine different languages for it to be coming out with soon awesome. as well. Um, and to, my home base on the internet is toddherman.me, toddherman.me. And uh, there you'll see links, you know, social media, Instagram, uh, Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter. So connect with me. If you liked the podcast, tag me, let me know uh, what your biggest takeaway was. And uh, yeah, I just love jamming people on this stuff. Yeah. And, and this has been one of the most fun episodes I've done ever. Uh, if people take away one big message from this episode and they carry it with them for the rest of their lives, what would you hope for that to be? Um, it's what I had said earlier that we, um, I think a mistake that I made early on was that I wanted to climb to the top of the mountain by myself to plant the flag and say, I did it. And it was slow and it was stupid. Um, and one of my mentors said it to me and it wasn't until I appreciated that you're going to go a lot farther. You're going to go a lot faster and you're going to enjoy yourself along the way a lot more when you think of yourself like I want to have a network around me that I am always within arm's reach, hands reach of someone who can help me get over an obstacle, make an introduction to open up a door or whatever. Um, and so we understand that from a physical you know, world. But then also don't forget that we're trying to build some allies and superheroes to live inside of our mind as well to help us navigate the, the difficult actions of getting from this to this or this to this out there. Incredible. Todd Herman, thanks so much for coming on the show. This was hey, awesome. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks for tuning in to the award-winning Superhuman Academy podcast. 
for more great skills and strategies or for links to any of the resources mentioned in this episode, visit superhuman.blog. While you're at it, please take a moment to share this episode with a friend and leave us a review on iTunes. We'll see you next week.